You're not the first, though, uh, to listen to a message of the gospel uh, from someone who looked a little different and strange. And uh, from guys like Jeremiah, who the Lord called to do some pretty extreme things, to John the Baptist, who preached the gospel out in the wilderness, in the middle of nowhere, wearing a garment of camel hair. And uh, I think John the Baptist was a good example of someone who didn't take himself very seriously, but took his message incredibly seriously. He said, I need to decrease. It's not about me, but he needs to increase. It's about Jesus. Uh, Dwight Eisenhower had a mentor and a man named Fox Connor who actually mentored several people uh, in the military, including Eisenhower and, and George Patton and, and Marshall. And um, he said that one of the things that Connor taught him that he's tried to, to pass along to many soldiers through his career in the military was what he, what he would tell them is, don't take yourself too seriously, but take your job very seriously. And I try not to take myself too seriously, and that has never been easier to say than it is right now, uh, wearing this. But I do take the gospel very seriously. And so while I look silly, uh, I do hope to preach a message to you that's very, very important. So if you would turn to John chapter 1. John chapter 1 is where we're going to pick up this morning. And John, the gospel of John is written by one of Jesus' disciples named John. But very early on, he introduces us to another John. John the Baptist. John the Baptist is that man who preached the gospel message out in the wilderness, wearing a a, a garment of of camel's hair, a gird with a leather belt. He he was living off of the wilderness, eating locusts and honey. Most important thing to John was preaching the message of Jesus Christ in the gospel. And what John tells us here pretty early is that John the Baptist made it clear from the beginning, it's not about me, it's about the one who comes after me who is greater than me. And so John chapter 1, verse 6 says this, There was a man sent from God whose name was John. The same came for a witness, to bear witness of the light, that all men through him might believe. He was not that light, but was sent to bear witness of that light. That was the true light, which lighteth every man that cometh into the world. He was in the world, and the world was made by him, And the world knew him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name, which were born not of blood, nor of the will of the flesh, nor of the will of man, but of God. And the word was made flesh and dwelt among us. And we beheld his glory, the glory as of the only begotten of the Father, full of of grace and truth. The Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory, full of grace and truth. In Charles Dickens' A Christmas Carol, Ebenezer Scrooge is visited by three ghosts. And those ghosts change his life by taking him first to the past, to look at his own past, taking him then to the present to show him that all around him are people in need and a family that he could belong to and celebrate with if he chose, and then taking him to the future to show him the doom that awaited him if he didn't change. What I want to show you this morning is a message of Christmas present, that presently, right now, today, there's truth that can be life-changing. But presently, right now, today, there is a family that we can belong to if we so true choose. You know, today, in our present day, Christmas can get kind of ugly. And I'm not just talking about ugly sweaters and suits. It doesn't, it doesn't take long to look around and see plenty of ugliness in our world from violence in the Middle East that is being exported to France and to our country. Refugees that are in crisis, those that wish to hide among them. The only time we break from that country or that coverage is to look at the sales that are taking place here in our country. The deals that you can get for this Christmas. And every year, materialism and capitalism nudge a little bit more of the nativity out of the frame of the Christmas story. And we lose the meaning of Christmas. But I want us to see through the ugliness today. I want us to see that Christmas is still beautiful and joyous. That it is still wonderful, 
splendid. That despite the materialism, despite the hatred and violence, despite the greed and the jealousy, there is a wonderful message. Even in our broken present day culture, Christmas is just as beautiful as it has ever been. Because this is a wonderful message that we have. Today I'm wearing an ugly outfit. And several of you have joined in the fun and you're wearing an ugly sweater. But even wearing this, I could sing along as Derek led us. How many kings have left their home for me? How many gods gave their son for me? Who would do that? Jesus has done that and Christmas is that celebration. So I want you to realize today that Christmas is a light in the darkness. John made it very clear, this is not about me, it's about the light that is coming. In verse 9 he said, the true light, which gives light to everyone, is coming into the world. In verse 14 says, the word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen his glory. Paul would say later on in 2 Corinthians 4, 6, God commanded the light to shine out of darkness, and it has shined into our hearts, giving us knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. John would say later in John 8, 12, quoting Jesus, Jesus would say, I am the light of the world. He that follows me will not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. The idea of these verses is that in the absence of Christ, there's darkness. But when Christ is present, there is light. When Christ is there, we can see. And the day and age that Jesus arrived in was definitely dark. The people were living under Roman rule. They had been taken over by the Romans. Everyone was experiencing their, their swift arm of political authority and power. People were responding to this by joining the Romans and actually taking up taxes for them. Other people had joined political organizations to take the Romans down. Meanwhile, in the, the priests and the, 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 the temple, there was an incredible amount of corruption. The office of chief priest was bought and sold. It was an office of power and means, not an office of spirituality and leading the people to a relationship with God. So this is the, 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 the context that Jesus arrives in. The people who had God dwelling in their midst in the temple, they have not heard from the Lord through a prophet in over 400 years when Jesus arrives on the scene. When Jesus gets there, he looks out on the masses at one point and he's, he's moved with compassion. His heart is burdened because what he sees is a group of people that are like sheep without a shepherd. They have no leadership. But when Jesus arrives in that dark time, it's like someone striking a match. And the darkness begins to be dispelled as the light begins to shine. And out of that group of people that joined the Romans and collected money and taxes from their own people, there was a name, man named Matthew who left that to follow Christ. On the absolute opposite side, there was Simon the Zealot. He was a part of the group that was trying to take the Romans down. Out of the darkness, he saw the light of Christ and followed him. Out of the group of the priests in the temple, Nicodemus sees the light of Christ and he follows him. And from all corners of this dark world, people begin to see the light and respond to the message of Jesus Christ. When we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate light coming into the darkness. We celebrate Christ coming to illuminate a dark, broken world. And whenever he is lifted up, Whenever that light shines, people from all corners of life are attracted to the light that He gives. Amen. Isaiah 9 prophesied of Jesus' birth. It says in verse 6, For unto us a child is born, unto us a son is given. The government shall be upon His shoulder, and His name shall be called Wonderful Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Maybe you're familiar with that verse. Four verses previously, what, what Isaiah says is the people that walk in darkness have seen a great light. They that dwell in the land of the shadow of death, upon them the light shined. When Jesus arrived, he brought light into darkness. On Christmas Eve, when we celebrate with a candlelight service, we're celebrating by saying Christ was the light he was that candle that came into a dark place. 
And when He is absent, we can't see what is real. We can't see what is true. But when He is present, there is a light for us to see. No more fumbling in the dark. No more stumbling in the dark. We can see the life that we are called to live, what we are meant to do. Story is told of a little girl who was listening as the preacher preached on John chapter 8 where Jesus said, I am the light of the world. And she was confused. So after the service, she asked the preacher, did you say you are the light of the world? He said, no, honey, Jesus is the light of the world. She said, well, I wish Jesus would come to our house because it's really dark at night. You know what? There are some really dark places in this world. But if Jesus is brought there, His light will shine. And the darkest of places can be illuminated. The scariest of places, the places that are the shadow of death, can be filled with light. And the beauty of this is that wherever you live, Christ can provide light. Christ was born in Bethlehem, but He brought light to the whole world. Jesus didn't arrive just to bring light to Bethlehem or Jerusalem. He brought light to the entire world. Do you have that one light switch in your house that you're not really sure why it's placed where it's placed? You know, you got to walk across the dark room to get to it to turn on the light, right? Or maybe you got that light switch, you have no idea what it goes to. Yeah, we can all identify with that. When Jesus arrived in Bethlehem, I'm sure most people would say, why there? Why did the light arrive there? But God had a plan for him to arrive in Bethlehem and live out his life in the area of Judea and then die a death in Jerusalem so that the entire world could receive light. That's why John said he is the light that lights the world. He was bringing the light to all of us. You say, okay, all right, he brings light. I get get your point. But he doesn't just bring light so we can see. He brings light so we can see something important. Because Christmas is a glimpse of His glory. Verse 10. Look at verse 10 if you've got your Bible open. Verse 10 says, He was in the world and the world was made through Him. Man, do you, do you get that? He was in the world that He Himself made. Verse 14 says, The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory as of the only Son from the Father, full of grace and truth. Do we grasp the power and the weight and the depth of those statements? I don't think we appreciate what Scripture just told us there. The God who created the earth came and walked the earth. The God who created the substance and the elements that make up the dirt came and walked and got his feet dirty, and got that dust between his toes. He came here in the nitty-gritty of this life. The God who made it all came here. The God who hung the stars and who pushed the planets into their orbit, he came and he was born in a little manger and cried for his mother. The God of the universe did that. So when verse 10 says he was in the world and the world was made by him, there's an incredible poetic depth to that. It's incredible. And when John says, we have seen his glory. We've seen his glory. Why is it that the God of the universe came and lived as a man and experienced hunger and experienced the weather and experienced pain and rejection and even loneliness. Why? So that we could get a glimpse of His glory. So that He could show us something incredible, something beautiful. And what is it that we see in this glimpse of glory? What is it that John tells us? The Word became flesh and dwelt among us, and we have seen His glory. Glory is of the only Son of the Father, full of grace and truth. What is it that we saw? We saw grace and truth. 
John doesn't tell us that Jesus came and we saw the glory of God and it was rainbows and lightning bolts and the mysteries of space. No. What was it that we saw when we saw Christ? We saw grace and truth. And friend, I'm thankful for every incredible, wonderful, amazing fact that scientists and explorers discover. But nothing has been of greater benefit to me than the development or the clarity of God's grace and His truth. And when Jesus came and gave us a glimpse into heaven, when Jesus came and gave us a view of something that we could only see through Him, what we saw was a life that epitomized grace and truth. A life that it was a demonstration of grace and truth. We should be thankful that Christ came not bearing the image of trivia. He didn't come bearing facts and figures. He came bearing the revelation of grace and truth. Friend, there's nothing more that you need in this life more than grace and truth. I could stand up here and give you an eloquent speech. I could teach you about all types of different things under the sun. You, you could go to the highest places of learning. You could see the most wonderful sights that this earth has to offer. You could go into space and look back at our earth and see that blue globe. And you would see nothing as wonderful as what John saw when he looked into the face of Jesus Christ and he saw grace and truth. There is nothing greater than that. The fact that God sent His Son so we might glimpse His glory and what we saw was grace and truth that is wonderful and splendid. When we celebrate Christmas, we celebrate the arrival of light but it isn't just light so that we can see our, and make our way. It wasn't just light so that we could read. It was light so that we could see the most important thing that we could ever see. God's grace and His truth. Jesus was the revelation of that. And that's the reason that I worship Him. That's the reason that I sing about Him. Because He was the picture of God's grace and truth. There's nothing more beautiful that I have ever seen than the picture of God's grace and His truth. Do you know the origin of, of Santa Claus? Do you know where that, that comes from? The story is told, the legend is told that in the city of Myra, many, many years ago, there was a poor man who had three daughters. And he had no money to pay for a dowry so that they could be married. Being a poor man as he was, it looked like they were going to be destined to remain single. And perhaps there was even a danger that when he passed off the scene that they would have no way of making it. This man was incredibly worried about what was going to happen to his daughter since he could not make enough money to pay a dowry for them to be married. But the bishop of Myra, his name was Nicholas. Nicholas was a young wealthy man. His parents had died when he was very young, left him a great inheritance, and he was very generous with the money that they had given him. When he heard the plight of these three daughters and their poor father, he decided that he would make an anonymous gift. Every time one of these girls came of age, he would make an anonymous gift of a bag of gold coins so that there would be enough money to pay a dowry so that they could be married. When the oldest girl came, he left the coins at the door. The second girl came of age. He left the coins at the door. And the father said, I'm going to be sure to be watching after the birthday of my youngest so that I can see this man who's been so generous and thank him. The legend goes that Nicholas wanted to remain anonymous. So that night, instead of placing the coins at the door, knocking and walking away, he climbed up on the roof and he dropped the bag down the chimney. Now it just so happened, according to the legend, that that youngest daughter had washed her socks the night before and she hung them by the fireplace so they would be dry and toasty in the morning when she woke up. And when Bishop Nicholas dropped the bag down the chimney, it landed in her stocking. 
And that's the reason that you hang a stocking by the chimney because Bishop Nicholas dropped on a gift. That's where the legend of St. Nick came about. But Nicholas is also famous for another legend. In AD 325, Constantine called many of the church leaders and fathers, many of the great theologians together for a council. They would eventually put together the Council of Nicaea, the Nicene Creed. Bishop Nicholas would sign it. But one of the things that they were discussing at this gathering was the nature of Christ. And there were some people that believed that Jesus wasn't God, but that he was like an angel. Because he was God's son, he wasn't, he wasn't equivalent to God. He was yet another of God's creation. As Nicholas listened to these people, he was bothered that anyone would demean the nature of the Christ that he loved and served. One particular man named Arius stood up and he began to go on and on about how Christ could not be God, but that he was something less than that. As Nicholas sat and listened, he became fed up. And he walked over to Arius and he told him to be quiet and to sit down, that he had said enough about Jesus. And when Arius refused, let's look at the next picture. Nicholas wound up and punched Arius square in the face. He apologized later. He felt badly about what he had done. But this man who was generous and kind, who was the inspiration behind the legend, he was angered because anyone would belittle the nature of the Christ that he loved and worshipped. Now, I don't recommend that you punch anyone in the face. <laughs> Even a heretic. But he was so passionate because in Christ he saw the revelation of God full of grace and truth. Friends, when we celebrate Christmas, we don't just celebrate generosity. We don't just celebrate kindness. We celebrate the revelation of God full of grace and truth. Christmas is a glimpse of His glory. And then lastly, Christmas is a picture of the family of God. In this passage, we looked at principles in the beginning and in the end. Verse 9 and the end of 14 tells us that Christmas is a glimpse of glory. Verse 10 and 14 tell us that it is, He is a light. But verses 11 and 12 are the heart of what John is telling us here. Let's look at verses 11 and 12 together. He came unto His own, and His own received Him not. But as many as received Him, to them gave He power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on His name. You see, the Christmas story isn't just about Mary and Joseph and Jesus. The Christmas story is about Mary and Joseph and Jesus and me. About Mary and Joseph and Jesus and you. It's not just about the family in that stable gathered around the manger. It's about the family of God welcoming you. My kids love to play with nativity scenes. We have several around our house. One of them is pretty nice like this one. It's white and it's glass. I don't know if this is glass or whatever it is, but it's breakable. I know that. Because the kids play with it, Joseph is missing an arm, Donkey is missing an ear. And occasionally when I see them playing with it, they've got Spider-Man and Superman there, you know, whatever character or figurine they have, they've got them there at the... You know what? You read the Christmas story, you're not going to see any of those names. But what John tells us is that any who receives him becomes a son of God. And even Spider-Man or Superman, or you or me, if we receive Him, we are welcome in the family of God. John says, as many as received Him, to them gave He the power to be the sons of God. You see, when Jesus came, He was born as a man. He lived a life that I could never live and eventually died a death that I could never die so that I could be welcomed into the family of God. 
His entire life, he was the revelation of God's glory, full of grace, full of truth. That's not me. My life, I am often short on truth and short on grace. But Christ was never short on either of those. He was perfect. And when he came down to his death, the death that he died was not for anything that he had done. It was for things that we had done. And through that life and death, John 1.12 becomes possible that as many as receive Him, to them He gives the power to be the sons of God. I love that more and more people, for their Christmas card, they have a picture of their family on it. I think that's wonderful. It's great. But sometimes we get... We get those cards from people on the coal side of the family. And I'm not as familiar with them. And I have to say to Nicole, well, that's a great picture. Who are these people? <laughs> Who is that? <coughs> if, if God were to send you a Christmas card that had a picture of his family, I'd be in it. And if you've placed your faith in Him, you'd be in it. How beautiful is it that this Christmas story is about Christ inviting us into His family. Sending His Son so that we would be welcome in the family. Christmas is a picture of the family of God that we are in if we choose to be. It would be pretty weird if I started popping up in all of your Christmas family photo cards, wouldn't it? <laughs> Especially in this suit, right, Dan? Right. You guys get together to take your family photo, and I, I show up. I'm ready for this picture, guys. So what are you doing? I'm going to be in your photo. What? Pastor Dan, we, you're okay, but you're not family. Jesus said, I've come so that you can be in my family. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. That He made it possible for us to be welcome into His family. You can be in the family of God if you choose to be. Boy, that, that's, that's the power of verses 11 and 12. But what does the verse 13 says? Which were born not of blood, nor of the will of man, nor of the will of flesh, but of God. You're not in the family of God because you were born into it. Not the family of God because you just decided you're going to be in it. But because Christ made it possible for you to be a part of the family of God. Amen. That's what we celebrate at Christmas. Let's bow our heads for a word of prayer. Father, I pray that we would see the beauty of what you did for us at Christmas. Lord, if there's anybody here, Lord, that they are not a part of the family of God, Lord, I, I pray that they would believe, they would know today that if they receive you, you will welcome them. Work in this time of invitation, I pray in your name. Amen.